going from one to eighteen hundred, right? Doing this eighteen hundred times, right? I mean, every day, you know, I, I think you know it's true, and you can, you know, there's a there's thankfully a lot more to discussion around this in the marketplace. You'll have the highest highs and lowest lows sometimes all in the same day. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Thanks for joining us today for the 1004 Show. We're here with V Band, CEO and founder of Contactually, and a couple other things as well that we'll talk about in a minute. But Zvi, I like to ask the, the, the toughest questions first. So where can someone find the best breakfast burrito in D.C.? You know, I, would, I hate to say um, it's it's pretty tough nowadays, but uh, there's a district taco, okay, um, like right outside my office. I'd probably say that's the go-to. How often uh, do you go there? Uh, two or three times a week or so. Nice, awesome. Yeah. So now the the easier questions. Uh, a couple of years ago, you started Contactually, which, in your words, is what. Uh, Contactually is a platform that helps professionals stay engaged with the key relationships that are going to unlock new repeat and referral business for them. Awesome. How often do you change that language? Uh, every two days or so. Every two days. Awesome. So we're yeah, on I, mean, two- it, it, I, I will say, you know, um, I'm a software developer by trade. I'm not a marketer. Um, and so one of the, uh, one of the key things that I, I've always known I need to improve on, which I continually do is how I describe the co- company um, and so that's that's always an ongoing battle did you know early on that you were not on the business side of it or the marketing side of it <clears throat> yeah absolutely very um, instantly um, I I actually spend more of my time on marketing and sales than I ever expected to but yeah I mean um, uh, I knew when I when I found it contactually that my passion and interests are more on the product side and the company side and the vision side. And so uh, I made the strategic uh, decision as I was kind of building my co-founder, uh, co-founder group um, th- to bring on someone who could say, yeah, you're the sales and marketing guy. Got it. But the weird thing, and I wouldn't rule out for, you know, for any founders out there, you may wake up one day and find your find yourself spending fifty percent of your time on sales, and don't fight it. You know, it's just you know, it's a fun thing to do. Oh, did you teach yourself how to do that on some of the first calls, or how did it work? No, I mean, I think it's a lot of experience. Um, obviously, I've read some books, um, but spending time around really good salespeople, um, and then honestly, um, I think the found being the founder and CEO, um, you have uh, this interesting ability to sell a lot better than you expect, right? You're simply telling the people the story of what, you, of what you're doing. And if you're able to convey your passion yeah. um, in your emails, in your pitches, in your stage presence, people glom onto that. It, it's interesting because as the founder and CEO of my own company, you know, I often, often, it's that story of how it got started. I was solving my own problem. That's not always the greatest things to do in starting a business, but I recognize very early on that a lot of people look like me, and by being able to tell that story, it, it, it does come across, and you are able to sell that. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it should, right? I mean, I think, yes, um, you, know, you shouldn't necessarily like you know, wake up one day and you hate your toothbrush and therefore say, oh, I'm going to build a better toothbrush per se, right? Um, but it's a combination of finding something that you're passionate about. And so usually it is a pain that something like you want to solve and you're willing to dedicate years of your life to married with, you know, customer development, ensuring that yeah. all right, this isn't just, you know, the exact crazy toothbrush problem. Or maybe it will be, who knows? So how old is contextually now? <clears throat> uh, we are, um, so it was just over six years ago that I first wrote down the idea for it in Evernote. Um, just about six years now where we probably started working on the first prototype. Um, and then so we were founded, and then we are incorporated in First Raise Capital in October of 2011. And the how long a time between kind of raising capital and, and that idea was there? Actually putting together the team, maybe a, um, an MVP or anything like that? Uh, four or five months. Okay. And so you guys raised capital for what specifically at that point? You know, um, so I was, I was, I had my own consulting business before this, 
And one of the things that I knew I needed to do where I had struggled before is I need to focus. Um, and if Kentaxi was going to be successful, I needed to devote 100% of my time on this. And so we initially weren't planning to raise capital, but then an offer came, you know, a fund offer of funding came in. And we said, hey, this actually could help us um, focus. You know, this could, for lack of a better term, this could be our burn the boats moment. Sure. You know, that moment where we say, all right, we're going all in and contactually. We don't have, we can raise a little bit of capital so we don't have to worry about paying the bills while we're getting up and running. We don't have to consult on the side. I could shut up, I could shut down my consulting business. So it really helped from a focus perspective. And that, that's been, that was the most valuable thing early on. Were you finding that you were lacking kind of that follow up that kind of contactually does in your consulting uh, firm and that was something that you needed to do and so you were kind of building this product for that or how did you kind of understand that this was an issue that was coming up? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, you know, I, I at least used to be a really introverted software engineer, right? You know, we just we were talking about schools before the show. Um, I went to Maryland freshman year of college. I was seriously thinking about going home every weekend <laughs> just so I didn't have to talk to people. Right. Um, but I ended up having a really good time. But I learned only after graduating and getting into the workforce that I learned the true power of relationships, not just of knowing the right people, but having the right people know you. Um, I was able to be CTO of a startup that was acquired back in 2009. Then I was able to run my own consulting business, and very quickly I was uh, working with likes of Ford and CBS and Volkswagen, and all these really, really great companies, just because the right people knew me. And so I said, well, how can I expand this? How can I make sure I'm staying in touch with the right people? Because I was forgetting people all the time. Um, I tried every other software on the market, and none of them helped me do what I need to do, which is follow up. You know, all of them were like, "Plug your data in all day long. Just type in, just fill in more information. Give me more data." And I said, "Well, software can help track who we're talking to. Um, software should be focused on helping tell us what we need to do hmm. to make our business successful." And so that was the initial nucleus behind Catastrophe. This kind of proactive CRM focused around relationships. So I think it, it makes total sense be around brands that can help you grow, but how do you kind of get your foot in the door to be able to be around those places when you might not have been anyone at that point or when you were scared and, and thought about going home every weekend, how could you kind of start to put yourself in, in the places to help you grow as a person and, and ultimately as a business? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it does involve throwing yourself in the deep end. Right. Um, it, it does. Yeah. yeah. Now, for me, um, I learned that it wasn't um, I didn't necessarily know about networking per se. Like I wasn't going to network. I was I knew I should make contacts. And so I did what I what's natural to us. I, I made friends. Right. You know, you go to an event and you would meet one one or two people and you have a conversation with them for a while. And then you follow up with them and stay in touch with them. And then the next event, oh, they'd be there. And you'd instantly go to them and say hi and eventually kind of build a build a good relationship with them, right? You know, it's not I was, you know, you're not just kind of, you know, jumping in, guns blazing, throwing business cards around everywhere, right? You just I went in and on just instinctively just started building deep relationships. Yeah. Um, in part because I was afraid to go meet someone new. I was like, no, I'd rather just keep talking to this person I have in front mm -hmm. of me. Um, but that ended up being this really powerful tool for me. Do you feel that there's, when you're moving from person to person at a networking event, that you can feel in yourself that, oh, I'm getting uncomfortable and this is very scary? Oh, absolutely. Like, even nowadays, you know, as extrovert I may be, you know, I may be like, you know, I may have half a dozen conversations and all of a sudden I find myself, you know, being that guy in the room who's kind of like, looking, all right, who do I talk to? Who do I talk to? Blah, 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 not engaging. And all of a sudden, I just like, the introvert in me kicks in and I bug out and I just get out of the room. <laughs> I'm just like, all right, I'm done. That's it. I felt I did my job. Even nowadays, it's silly. I, I laugh at myself when I'm doing this. But, you know, and that's okay, right? You know, I, I still admit that I'm an introvert. So sure. I kind of, you know, I've countered it by setting myself goals, right? I'm going to go and I'm going to meet three new people. And once I do that, then I can bug out. 
Interesting. So is that kind of what created the DC Tech Meetup, which you are also a founder of? Yeah, you know, the a lot of the um, community work that I've been involved in has been this whole idea of connecting people and building relationships. So, yeah, I mean, I... I was networking and getting involved in quote the startup community before there really was a community, um, and I realized like I had made a lot of connections, but they didn't know them didn't know each other, and so it was just kind of a lot of very early experience experiences. So for example, I uh, I realized that I knew there was a big startup community in D.C. I knew there were a lot of companies. I knew like Living Social was in D.C. and O Power and all these great companies, but a lot of my other friends didn't realize that there were companies. So I said, oh, well, I can build a little website showing that there, you know, showing that there was uh, a community. Mm -hmm. And so that's what became Proudly Made in DC, which ended up on the front page of the New York Times and really kind of, you know, successful like that. Um, And then I said, well, great. We have all these people who are together um, and all these people who want to connect with each other and want to know about the startup community. Let's just kind of, you know, let's, let me get a few of my techie friends together in a room. And so the first DC Tech meetup was, you know, 150 people, you know, most of whom I knew, uh, most of whom I consider my friends. And then the next meetup was 300. Wow. And then the meetup after that was 400. And now we regularly get like, you know, eight to 900 at every single event. And the idea is just to put people that might be similar in a room? Yeah, the model that is like, all right, we're the big tent of the DC uh, startup community. Um, let's show let's show some new technology up on stage. But more importantly, I want everyone in the audience to get to know each other um, because you know you may sit down next to someone who ends up being your co-founder, yeah. um, or maybe someone says, "Hey, I'm an investor," and you run to them because you have an idea for a company that needs to get funded. It's interesting. Back in 2010, I was <coughs> running through a very similar challenge where I have friends that are moving uh, to different places because they didn't yeah. know what groups were happening or, or what companies were starting. And so I started an event called Startup Night where we do present a couple of things and, and, and we don't get 900 people, but uh, we get you know a good amount of people in, yeah. in our office to meet each other that otherwise wouldn't have met each other. And so it, it's interesting how we have similar paths in, in that piece where, you know, you might you might be the conduit. You might be that that piece to kind of put those people in a place together, and you don't even actually have to make that introduction. It's kind of just like this: I'm going to give you guys the four walls, and hopefully the right people come, and and it happens. Yeah. And that's obviously, as you know, that's been helpful to your career as it's been to mine. Right? It's not like you know, deli- when when I think about relationship building and delivering value, um, a lot of the people who I'm building relationships with. Um, meaning people who know me, I don't even necessarily. I've, I maybe I've never spoken to them, but they've gone to three meetups I've been running, yeah. right? You know, and they've been at my events, and then they've checked out Contaction, they've checked out my blog, right? That's a really valuable experience that you're delivering to people. And so when I tell people, you know, when we're talking to people about relationship marketing, this act of strategically building relationships, um, it's all about how you deliver value to people. And it, maybe it's not limited to just sending emails and going after coffee one on one. It could be, hey, let's get fifty people who don't know each other into a room and let's talk about some cool stuff for an hour. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Someone asked me, what's the number one tool or thing that helped grow my business or even myself? Hundred percent, it's meetups because yep. it just it just brings people together and 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 it, and it makes you an authority even if you weren't at that point and it's interesting to see how that's happened so contactually has grown over the years you guys have have raised a significant um amount of capital what are some of the challenges that you guys are now currently going through or you as a person that before you weren't and so uh, i'll preface it by saying you know when you're starting your business you are working probably in your business you're having a lot of fun with it and now yeah. you're working kind of on the business um, you know, how does that kind of change your life? Yeah, it's the balance between the two, right? I mean, like, it's definitely been a very big personal evolution. Like, I was the guy that when I graduated, when, when my parents brought home their first computer um, and I started learning how to code, I was like, oh, yep, I'm gonna just going to do this for the rest of my life. Um, and now, you know, I've got 11 engineers that are smarter than me and don't even let me code anymore, right? Mm. You know, it's kind of, you know, you, you're kind of your role is evolving all the time. Um, I do say that I 
do definitely struggle with the balance between working on your business versus working in your business. You know, I'm always thinking about capital needs and thinking about strategic positioning and acquisitions and things like that. Um, but then at the same time, I'll be jumping in and doing an interview with someone or I'll be working on a slide sheet or I'll be sending bug reports in. You know, I, I do struggle with that. Um, I find, you know, Contaxia, we're now passing 65 people and uh, it's a real big challenge to deal with the communication issues, right? You know, when we were five people in a room, you know, there's no communication problem. You know, everyone is sitting next to each other and they know what they're going, they're, they know what they're doing, right? Yeah. You know, just, you can see see everyone's computers. Now, you know, I there are like probably 10 more meetings going on right now um, and I don't know what they're talking about. Um, and so it's like, it's been a little challenging to kind of, you know, deal with the communication issues. How, but obviously there are benefits from it. Sure. So how do you emotionally get through that? Uh, trust, right? Um, you know, one of the, um, and you know this, one of the biggest challenges of growing a team is having to give up responsibility. Mm-hmm. And as the guy who had the initial idea behind Contactually, who was the core product person for years, who every wire, who was doing every wireframe, now my involvement in product is maybe two hours a week. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's it took a lot to give that trust away to now a really good, great product team. And of course, sometimes trust gets broken, and you have to make some personnel changes. And uh, you know, you can't be afraid of that. But no, there's definitely a. Uh, a trust is the main thing because at this point I trust my head of sales to sell. I trust my head of product to build the right product. I trust my head of customer success with our customers, right? So that allows me to pull up, focus on what I need to do, um, check in with them every, you know, every, you know, every, you know, every couple of days, see how things are going and be in great shape from there. Do you, I love the word that you use trust because I think that's ultimately why you hire people is you do things that can help you replace the things that you're not good at. And if you hire the right people, then yeah. they can do that and you can ultimately grow and, and, and hit the impact that you want to do. Um, and so do you have like a big number of, um, of users that you're looking for or customers? Is, is that like a goal that you're looking at and you tell everyone that comes on says, you know, we want a million customers on contextually or how does that work? No, I mean, we have the big, hairy, audacious goal um, of, like, wanting this to be a, a very, very, very big company. Um, so we definitely put, so we definitely push people towards that. Um, because we're a growing company, um, we look at revenue. So we say, hey, what do we need to do to get to X revenue amount? And we kind of push people towards that. Uh, but, I mean, I think the thing that guides us all the time is our mission and vision. Um, so we've been very good at codifying our mission statement. Um, and it's something that people really truly believe in. Um, and we push people, we talk about people, and we say, hey, this is why you're here today. What is your mission? Um, is we believe the best businesses in the world are built upon personal and authentic relationships with our clients and partners. Awesome. Do you, when you onboard someone, are you having them kind of understand that mission as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we we dig a lot and I'm thankful for the culture that we've been able to build, um, you know, as a, as a team. And so one of the aspects of that is really indoctrination, frankly, you know, getting them to drink the Kool-Aid, right. You know, in I think an authentic way, but really kind of getting them to understand the importance and the idea behind relationships. Interesting. What has been some of the biggest challenges <clears throat> from day one to now day 1800? Uh, going from one to 1800, right? Doing this 1800 times, right? I mean, every day, you know, I, I think, you know, it's true and you can, you know, there's, a, there's thankfully a lot more to discussion around this in the marketplace. You'll have the highest highs and lowest lows, sometimes all in the same day. Um, and that happens every single day. Um, you know, I woke up today for some reason feeling incredibly deflated and nervous and concerned. And then obviously today's actually been a great day. Um, that's been, so it's kind of, you know, it's dealing with those challenges. Um, and more importantly, it's, you know, being able to put aside your feelings, 
the failures you're you're having, the successes you're having, and saying, you know what, I'm going to keep doing this day after day after day. And so, yeah, to do this 1,800 times, that's that's been the biggest that that's been the hardest skill. And then honestly, now indoctrinating, you know, um, 65 people saying, hey, no matter what, come back tomorrow morning. Mm. I, I think it's crazy because uh, that roller coaster ride does happen, right? And uh, I tell people all the time, you know, I've literally within 20 minutes had lost a huge contract, and then 20 minutes later get a call that, hey, you got something even bigger, and you're like, how? Like, why? Why did this just happen? Why couldn't this? Why did it have to happen the same day? But man, like, it's it's crazy. And so, how do you kind of get through emotionally when, when yeah. you're down? You just try and stay even keel, or or worse, yet, or worse yet when you have the highest high and lowest low and nothing changes literally it's like in your mind you're just thinking right and something happens right you know it 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 gets it gets pretty rough um no i've uh there are a lot of best practices out there you know meditation i always push people on you know as you know as as a pretty serious topic um getting good exercise eating well um but no i mean i always make sure that when I'm really high, like when things are or not, when I'm really high, when things are going really well, that you kind of capture that for the team saying, Hey, remember this time, remember these moments we will have low moments. I always want us to be able to reflect on these. Um, and then when things are, uh, when things are feeling down to kind of take those steps of gratitude, right. Um, realize like, and I, I've started uh, using this tool, like five minute journal, um, and I started like journaling. I know Tim Ferriss is a big fan of it. Others are. Um, but just to think back, okay, um, maybe I'm feeling down right now, but I have a great family, I've got a great company. I have a product I believe in. Um, we've got customers who love us and kind of walk through those elements of gratitude. Uh, but the most important thing is, uh, I know mindfulness is this like, you know, fuzzy topic that everyone loves to, uh, loves to think about Zach, but, uh, it really comes down to me for, you know, you and I know that emotions change. And I think as long as we're able to almost like take a step, like we talked about working in your business versus on your business, like be in, be like thinking about like being, take a step outside of your body. Right. And almost saying, all right, V sad right now. That's fine. Keep doing what you're doing. And like that's it, right? If you're able to kind of do that at, do that and make sure that you're taking a step outside of yourself and realizing, hey, right now Zvi is sad and this is just a temporary state. Here's why Zvi is sad. Who cares? He can be sad. Here are the 15 things we're gonna do today anyways. Yeah, that's been really helpful. So I, I still no matter so that's why I think you know we've been able to keep going because no matter what, you know, my team is able to say, all right, well, this is still what we're going to be doing today. Period. Period. It's interesting. If you're playing poker, you remember the the card that you lost with, but you don't remember the hands that you win with. And it's kind of like that though. It's like, just get yourself out of the body. I love that. Um, exactly. And then, you know, try, try and take steps of gratitude to be through that. We're talking with Zvi, Bra- uh, Zvi Band of Contactually, and you can find them at contactually.com. How did you kind of come up with the name? Uh, the domain name was available. I wanted something contact related, but really like, um, it was, uh, the domain name was available. I was kind of trying all these different variations. In fact, uh, I'll let you in on a secret. Um, the contactually wasn't always our company name, uh, for about a month in the very beginning, uh, the original name of contactually was enforcery, um, which sounds like an IT security company, but. It was, but it was all about enforcing relationships. And again, it was the only name I could come up with. So I said, all right, you know, until we can come up with a better name, this is what we're doing. Very interesting. I uh, appreciate your time today. You live in the or the Contactually is based in, in Washington, D.C. What Washington, D.C.-based sports team will win a championship first? A, cup, uh, a team that has, that has yet to move to D.C. Uh, I'm done. I'm 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 washing my hands in sports. No, no, no. I think the Caps. Um, I'm a I'm a big believer. The Caps are consistently they're really good. They always do something stupid in the finals. But uh, I'm I'm a big believer. But uh, I I'm a Maryland fan. I've given up on Maryland. Redskins are a whole different story. Nats are a whole different story. But uh, I think the Caps are going to go. Uh, are someday uh, in the next decade, uh, they're going to do well.
So at some point, the Caps will win. Check out <laughs> District Taco, and most importantly, check out Contactually. You can find them at contactually.com's V Band. I appreciate your time today and uh, continued success. But wait, you didn't even ask me what my favorite hot sauce is. What is your favorite hot sauce? I mean, come on, I'm looking over your shoulder for the past half hour, right? Um, I've eaten all those too. What is your I'd, favorite I'd hot probably, sauce? I'd probably have to say uh, JT Pappy's Gator Grenade. Have you ever had Gator Grenade? No. What is oh, it? JT's man. what? Uh, JT Pappy, like P A P P Y, uh, Gator Grenade. If you just look up Gator Grenade, um, that is like the best hot sauce. Are you familiar with the First We Feast Hot Ones um, YouTube channel? I watch it way too much. Okay, so we did that. We went through the all 10, my team and I did. Oh my god. Let's just say that um, the first five, maybe even first six, are fairly easy. And then it exponentially just gets... Because you're going from like... A jalapeno to a couple oh, thousand scovels. Oh, I'm watching meter go and like, wow, yeah. It goes, it goes from like the first five is like zero, probably a hundred to fifteen thousand, and then you go from fifteen thousand to like one fifty thousand, and then, and then there's like three fifty, and then I think the last one's like six hundred, and it's um the key though is milkshakes. Interesting, because it's got the sugar and the and um it's got the sugar in it. It's got the okay, that's a good idea. If you do it, check it out. Uh, and it actually didn't last. The pain didn't last as, as long as I thought it would. Um, but things that now that were hotter before are not as hot now. So it's it's great. Well, hopefully at one point we'll meet somewhere in between North Oka, D.C. And, uh, do, uh, and try that again. We should. Well, I appreciate your time. And um, we'll, we'll eat some hot sauce together. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely.